Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for listening. Um, and thanks to Rob for being super cool and allowing me to go do this consulting business at the same time, letting me stay at Dragos. I'm in work heaven right now because I'm um, working with small water utilities in Massachusetts, helping them build out cybersecurity programs. Like two weeks ago, I was literally putting in CIS benchmarks on an HMI, which is a really painful process. So uh, maybe you should think twice if you try to do what I do. Um, because what we're telling everybody to do is really hard. I guess that's my point. Um, and then with Dragos, I, I'm in this really cool role. I moved into the OT cert team. And if you're not familiar with OT cert, it's a free program for small and medium sized businesses. Dragos sort of recognized that a lot of the small and medium sized businesses don't have the resources and staff and, and funding to, to do their security process. And so we're allowing free membership and we're putting out tons of information on a monthly basis like on the how to, like, how do you, how, like, here's a worksheet to go fill out for your incident response plan. Here is a video that shows you how to do backups for protecting yourself against ransomware. And so this, and then monthly, we have like over 700 members in 60 countries. And we do these monthly webinars where people can jump in, ask questions, sort of building a community. So I have a slide at the end, encourage everybody who sort of fits in that small, medium sized category to join. Uh, it's a really cool program and it's it's uh, fun for me to be involved. Anyway, today I'm talking about secure remote access. And what I'm gonna do is present that there's lots of different ways to do this. And there are some fundamental principles to making sure you're doing it right. And I'm gonna talk about various aspects of that, present some different architectures that I've seen, you know, in Dragos and elsewhere to uh, for people handling this and doing it the right way. Um, I do want to also call out that when I put this outline together, I took advantage of working at Dragos and I sat down with Jackson Evans, Davies and Aaron Boy, two amazing pen testers and like looked at what makes their life hard or easy when they're trying to penetrate te penetration test into OT environments. And so got their insights built it into the talk and happy to share that. And they were really cool to let that information make their lives harder. So the first one I want to talk about is what is generally the de facto standard um, for secure remote access. Everybody's probably seen this similar diagram where we have out on the outside, you know, whether it's on your enterprise network or from the internet, somebody, you know, setting up a VPN, remoting in, going through a firewall, landing in a jump server. Maybe you see them landing in a landing server on the OT side and from there doing whatever they need. So this is not new concept, but there are some principles that we can talk about with this structure that then we can apply to other architectures that I'll talk about as we move through. So the first thing, right, is the VPN, setting up that initial secure channel um, with authentication uh, is critical. The next piece of that is to have that multi-factor authentication piece. So you get your username, password, and then some other token of some kind to, to stand up that secure tunnel into the perimeter of the environment. In this case, I'm using, you can see RDP there, right? So the next thing I put up here is NLA, and this is oddly specific for a overall architecture, but network level authentication is important when you're using RDP. And not every or, um, architecture is gonna be using RDP. So why is NLA part of these principles? It's because whatever you're gonna implement is gonna have some weird detail that you need to think about in this case, RDP was, you know, vulnerable to denial of service and remote code execution by Bluekeep if you didn't have NLA enabled. And, you know, other things that, you know, it's nothing's ever simple. But, you know, so the point here is whatever technology you use, there's going to be some detailed gotchas that you have to do your due diligence and look at how things are implemented. And that theme of how things are implemented is through this talk throughout. So next thing is the different credentials. So when you're coming from your remote device to that jump server, you have one set of credentials. When you're going from that jump server into the OT environment, it has to be a different set of credentials. Try to use group policies to make them different password requirements, different username requirements. So your, your users can't you know, decide to make them the same after the fact. So super important to have those be two different accounts. Next thing about that is make sure those accounts are not administrative rights. So these are the kinds of things that, you know, when our pen testers, you know, steal some credentials and leverage those, you know, normal credentials to get into environment and then they have admin, it just makes their life that much easier to, main, to set up persistence and move laterally and do everything they need to do. So 
That's why these like little keys are really important to think about as you look at your remote access and, and where you're, you know, your current one and your future one, where you're going if you start to think about, hmm, are we doing this right if we have it now? So those are the things just in a list form, right? Here's are the fundamentals, VPN, multi-factor, a DMZ based jump server. Yes, I have RDP enable NLA, but put in whatever weirdness is associated with your solution that you're using, separate credentials, and those accounts should not be admin. So that's like the de facto standard. Now there are a lot of secure, specifically built secure remote access commercial tools out there. There, I'm not gonna get into specific products today because if I haven't vetted them or I don't wanna recommend them, although I will say that there are some really good promising technologies that are sponsoring this conference. I'll leave it at that, but it's due diligence is really important for everybody. Um, certainly making sure regardless of the technology that you implement, following those key principles that I just talked about is really important. And when you're evaluating a tool, look for things like they test against STIG. So these are DOD, DISA, uh, technical implementation standards that you know vendors should test themselves against to make sure they're doing rigorous processes to do things right. Nothing is ever going to be secure. No technology is going to be secure, but if they're doing this process, you know they're going in the right direction. If you layer, you know, them doing the right thing with, you know, getting third-party evaluations and following STIGs or other equivalent standards, and you're using this architecture that I'm talking through in this talk, you'll be at least have a fighting chance of, you know, preventing or detecting abuse of remote access early in that kill chain. Um, so this is another really interesting uh, architecture that I saw implemented in a couple of different, this was a mature customer who had the skills and the money, but we see starting from the outside, right? They still had the VPN with multi-factor authentication. Their first hop though, was a, a next gen level firewall that had active directory integration with their enterprise domain controller. Once they authenticated there, they made a jump over to the perimeter firewall at the ICS OT level, which had its own Active Directory integration with its own distinct domain controller. And from there, they could go to a landing server and do whatever it work, whatever work they needed to do. Like this doesn't follow that same de facto standard with the, with the DMZ and the jump server, but this is a pretty mature implementation. The key being the two different domain controllers and the integration on Active Directory there. So I just wanted to present this as a viable alternative solution. We're gonna talk about monitoring which is a really important piece of all this in a few slides, but this was just a very interesting architecture that I wanted to put out here as I talked through various things that I've seen. So this one, right? So then there are commercial tools that aren't necessarily designed for secure remote access. We see them all the time. This is, you know, we, I can't tell you how many times I've seen VNC and TeamViewer in environments. And just because they're there and we shouldn't run with our hair on fire, like in fact, most of the time, you know, you go to do an assessment and they already have remote access and is it secure? Who knows? But, you know, if you have this, like go do this process to design what the right size secure remote access is for your risk level and your environment. But before or in parallel, if you have it already, do use the, um, the basic hardening uh, procedures that are available for the tools you're using. So I know VNC and TeamViewer have recommended security configurations that you can go and follow. They, they support multi-factor. They support blue. Ah, I'm back. So um, anyway, so I would recommend if you have an existing remote access up front, you know, check your firewall, make sure that you are, you know, you can go on VNC's website and find out all of the IP addresses associated with their cloud infrastructure. Set your policy to deny, accept these IP. Don't forget you have to allow, you know, DNS for VNC to establish those IP addresses. But and then what else do you need? Like so set those, configure that firewall to only allow what you need. So um, by the way, this information, again, OT cert, if if you want some takeaways, all this stuff is put out on how to's with OT cert documents. So please join. Um, but anyway, uh, so, so I, what I was saying was, you know, VNC and TeamViewer, it's not necessarily the tools that are the problem, it's how you implement them. And so using their recommended secure configurations, making sure you're following 
that um, process that I laid out earlier uh, will really make a big difference in terms of uh, how, how your uh, security is implemented. If they don't support multi-factor VPN, that's time to think about a different tool, okay? So, uh, so don't run scared if you see that you're using TeamViewer. Take a look at it, make sure it's implemented securely, and then take a step back and think about, is this the right size secure remote access for my environment? And I could talk a little bit more about that in a later slide. So the next piece that's really important to a secure remote access is monitoring, right? So having all that protective stuff that we just talked about in those previous slides can all be bypassed. If you're not monitoring, you're not going to be able to tell, to tell when it's, they're abusing your existing access and, and doing whatever you know, they need to do on the, on the inside of the OT. So I'm going to go through a few slides talking about various aspects of monitoring remote access. Starting first ex at the external point. So looking at what do you look like to the internet or to the outside world? And so you can use things like Shodan to do automated scans. You can use CISA, I believe has a service that will monitor your external IP addresses to tell you what you're exposing. Potentially you have vulnerable services exposed, you know, and so you should understand what that looks like because everybody else is looking at it and you should know what you're, expo what you're exposing. So that's step one. And, and you can, like with Shodan, you can set up automated alerts. When some new service pops up on your perimeter, you can know about it and you can, is this normal? Is this, you know, go through a change process? Is this uh, acceptable or not? And so you can respond. So that's the first piece for monitoring. Next one down the chain is looking at your VPN, right? So in many cases, the VPN and the firewall are in one. In other cases, they're separate. Um, but you need to look at that um, specifically configuration changes. Is something changing in your VPN configuration? Also looking at behaviors for people VPNing in, um, looking at the, the geolocation of the IP addresses or geo IP velocity. Is it at one point in Texas and two hours later it's in Germany? Like, is that normal? Those are, so none of this is really simple or canned or easy to look at, but it's important to track at this perimeter level because Incident responders will say, you know, and I'm not an incident responder, but I, you know, I, I work with a bunch of them, and they say that once, you know, however many steps past initial access, you detect that thing is so the complication of remediation gets so much higher because they'll set up new new persistence, new command and control, never come back to that initial access vector, and so try to find all that gets harder, and so if you can you know, do detection early in the kill chain, your life gets so much easier in terms of pre preventing the catastrophic consequence and also, you know, remediation. So like I said, looking at behaviors of users, um, making things look normal and looking for configuration changes on not just this device, but all of your critical assets, especially. Um, so the next level of monitoring is host-based, right? So we look at network-based and host-based. On host-based, all of these individual assets will generate their own logs and events based on what's going on. So for example, you know, on that jump server, if you're seeing new processes spin up, that is, you know, in a, generally that should be a pretty stable machine. You shouldn't have new processes starting up. So if you see a new process starting up, it should be worthy to be able to detect that and go look at what that is and validate if it's normal or if it's not. Um, brute force attempts. I don't, I'm going to run on time. So I'm not going to go through all these, but I would just say, hit me up on Slack or whatever, and I'm happy to talk through the details of all of these for, for important items to pay attention to on host-based um, monitoring of all of the critical assets specific to your remote access, as well as some of your other critical ICSOT assets. Um, on network-based monitoring, similar thing. You should, be, you should know what IP addresses you expect to see in your environment. When you see out, IP addresses outside your VPN pool or outside, you know, your internal addressing scheme, you should know what that is and you should document that. So you, so it's, it's, you don't have to go through a fire drill if you see one and, and, and other, ideally you shouldn't see any, but likely you, you may. Right. And so um, that's important, an easy one to pick out. Also unexpected ports and services. If you see, you know, WinRM, which is a protocol that supports a lot of administrative functions on Windows machines, and you don't use that, or you know, not to this device, or you know, it's um, in a different flow or something, you should be able to detect that, and you should, and you should investigate it. 
DNS, same thing. That DNS information is telling you what applications and services are trying to talk out to the internet. If you have a domain or you have internet connectivity, you're going to have DNS. If you look at those DNS queries, you're going to see what things are calling out to the internet to find out where their stuff is. So that's interesting, right? I have found secure, I mean, I have found remote access tools in an environment that they didn't know they had or they thought they were gone, but you see DNS queries from those things, even if they're not in use, and you say, hey, yeah, this, this device over here has got TeamViewer on it, and, and they go and remediate that. Then if you see the responses from those queries, now you have communication going on, so that's an interesting thing. Is that what you expect? So DNS is a really important data source to look at, and I will say, even if you don't have the staff or people to look at it, if you can log it, it's going to be really important for investigations when solar winds happened. One of the ways everybody found out if they were affected is looking in the DNS information. If they didn't have those logs, it became much harder to figure out if they were affected and, and all that uh, solar wind stuff. Um, again, behavioral stuff. Do you see files moving? Do you see a user who typically shouldn't touch an HMI or a PLC trying to connect to that? That kind of stuff. I have this bullet point east west versus north south. And generally, when we think you know, initially we're going to do security monitoring. We're going to get the perimeter stuff going from the trusted to the untrusted. And that's typically north-south. And that makes sense, right? So much, so much of the time an adversary may abuse existing authorized services to gain access into an environment. And you can't pick that out north-south. When you start to look east-west, you see network scanning or a connection with WinRM going to another device that's not normal. If you don't have that east-west visibility, you're not going to necessarily see it coming through the perimeter or through your, your trust boundary. So that's why when you design your monitoring, it's important to try to capture east-west. I mean, that's as simple as using a span port on a switch. If you have a small environment, you can use a span port on your switch and you're going to get not only north-south, what's going up to your firewall, but you may get, you know, what's going between your PLCs and HMIs. It all depends on your architecture, but the point is make sure your visibility is comprehensive enough so that you can you can you know, detect malicious activity, even when your trusted services are being used and exploited. And then the bottom bullet there, DPI. DPI. So this is really about looking at that ICS specific uh, stuff. So we have function codes in, in our protocols that communicate to our ICS devices. Like, so we have a PLC, maybe it speaks Modbus. And within that protocol of Modbus, we have function codes like read multiple registers or write registers understanding what the function codes are normal in your environment so you can detect you know at a packet level like that when something's going wrong like you know a, re a hard reset or uh, you know disable unsolicited responses or some sort of function code like that for dmp3 in that case um is is important context to see when there's something interesting at that critical ics purdue level 1 device like a PLC or a relay or something like that. Um, this slide is really just to show you what some artifacts would look like if you were, you know, if you did a network capture and you're looking at, you know, you see that your DNS information and you can see in there that you're some subdomain of teamviewer.com or you see TCP port 5938 communicating. Like these are the little details that can help you to figure out what's going on in your environment. You may not know you know, what's in there. And you may have too many assets to go and dig around, but if you capture some traffic and do a little bit of analysis in your DNS or uh, uh, just simple conversations about what's going on, they'll give you a lot of insight into what may be happening in your network. And then the bottom two lines there, there are free resources like Robtex and Gray Noise. It will tell you a lot of information about, you know, remote, you know, external IP addresses or domains. Are they malicious? Or are they normal? I would venture to guess that if you did a capture on your network, you'd see a lot of attempts to go to Microsoft and Skype and all this junk that comes with a Windows box when a, you know, a, a systems integrator or somebody puts it on your network and never does anything to remove unnecessary ports and services, you're going to see it talking. And, you know, is it getting there? And, and but you'll certainly see it. Uh, so I just wanted to put this there to show you sort of what some of these artifacts may look like if you did do that. Um, so this slide, I wanted to talk about what a jump host should look like, right? Because um, when you go and you, somebody gives you that drawing of this architecture, like, oh yeah, that's great. How do I go do that? There's so many decisions that go into like, what should I build? Should my jump host be a Windows server? Should be a Linux server? Should I use RDP, SSH? Like, so 
um, it, it gets complicated. And, and, and when you, and specific to jump hosts, it's, it's, re, it's really important that the jump host be like a barren wasteland, right? So when that user lands on the jump server and this, like say it's RDP, they have a remote desktop connection or even a VNC connection to that jump server, they should see nothing. They should see no access to PowerShell, nothing, no command prompt. If they can't see the taskbar, that's even better. All they should see ideally is a barren wasteland with a link that stands up that next connection into the environment. This particular slide really came from talking with Jackson. Uh, Jackson Evans Xavier's a pen tester on when he lands on a jump server, you know, he, he just uses what's available. And if you're exposing all that stuff, don't make their life easy. So that's the, that's the point when you build out your jump, jump host. I would also say if you're doing it in a virtualized environment, think about making two. It's really simple to just make two VMs, one for your vendors and one for your internal staff. That way, if you need to isolate one or, you know, if tracking and, and, and monitoring and things like that becomes a lot simpler if you have that divvied up. And if it's virtual, you know, go for it. Um, in general, we think about remote access as like, you know, users using your system remotely, but there are other types of remote access we want to think about. Like, for example, if you're a distributed system, you have remote sites, that is remote access. And do you know what those data flows coming in and out from that site to your main site or, or whatever are? Do you, do you use a default deny and only allow explicitly what is required for those, those sites? across that trust boundary. That's, it's really important to think about that. There was a case on EISAC uh, where a, um, I think it was, well, I shouldn't, regardless, somebody stole an RTU from, an, from a customer. And it made me think, wow, like so take an RTU, which is like a remote terminal unit that's monitoring some value out in the field. Usually has like a, for example, a cell modem in it. Somebody steals that RTU, powers it up. Now they have a cell modem into your, into your environment. They know your IP address scheme from the devices that are on the RTU. Do you have an ability to detect that? Do you have an ability to know who you need to call to shut down that particular access? Like, so this was a really good um, inject for maybe a tabletop drill, like thinking through your response procedures on something like that. Um, so when we talk about the reason I'm talking about this is because when we talk, think about remote access, we can't just think about, you know, user interactive remote access on, you know, monitoring or maintaining your system. You have to think about things like, you know, your remote sites. Um, what else I want to say? So that's hardening, uh, logging. One important piece on logging uh, that I for neglected to mention on the slide about uh, team viewer and, and VNC is when you look at network traffic for those services, you're not going to see the end device IP address. You're going to see some connection to a, a team viewer server or a VNC cloud server. You have to look in the logs for that application and find out and validate if your remote user is actually who you think it is and not somebody else. Even if you're not doing that on a regular basis, you should know where that information is. So if you had to, you could go dig it up. So document that. Um, that's part of the logging and monitoring recommendations around around this. Um, and so uh, again, on vendors, it wouldn't be the first time that I have seen vendors take advantage of, of their trust and maybe use tools that they weren't supposed to use, come in outside time windows that they weren't supposed to come in and things like that. And so it's important to, when you allow vendor remote access to try to build that into your program, maybe hopefully ask them to use the tools that you use. Lots of vendors like to use their own tools. And I have seen lots of customers who have five, six different remote access mechanisms based on what the vendor prefer prefers. If you can leverage any policies you have to kind of like condense that, highly recommend it because trying to track all that is really challenging and vendors can be an access, can be an abuse or access point into your environment. We've seen it before in lots of public, you know, incidents. So that's why it's important uh, consideration to throw on this slide. Another one I see a lot is people who have like just so much remote access from their corporate side. So all the engineers need to get to the historian. The historians on the inside. That's part of their work. But like, if it was up to me every single remote connection into your environment should be able to be validated so that it's real. It, it depends on your risk level, but you know, if you have, you know, potential 
unacceptable consequences from remote access abuse, then you should be able to validate every single connection into your environment. And if you have tons of people hitting your historian, well, can you move that out into the DMZ so they don't need to remote get remote access into your OT environment? They can get what they need. Same thing with if you have like operators who are off shift and they need to figure out if there's a real problem in your system off hours. Can you put a read only version of the HMI sitting in the DMZ so they don't need to go through all of the steps to get in? Because you know one of the things that you do get a lot of pushback on um, is you know operations staff don't, don't necessarily love computers. I don't necessarily love computers either. Um, and so you know they, they're like, wait a sec. I have to log onto my laptop. I have to log onto the VPN, multi-factor authentication, log onto the jump server, log onto the inside server. And then I have another application, my, my HMI application, I have to log in. Like, what are you doing? And, you know, and maybe that that's necessary. So, you know, you have to push back, but can you make their life easier by, like I said, take an HMI and put a read-only client in the DMZ or just, you know, be creative about reducing the amount of connections into the environment by using some different, you know, ways of providing that data out. Um, where everything should have started, right? I put this last because I wanted to talk about those architectures. And uh, but when you build your, when you right size your remote access solution, it really needs to start with evaluating the risks. Like, what are the consequences that could happen if somebody abused your remote access into your environment? I have seen, you know, some water utilities who, you know, they, their flow meter is wired directly to their chemical metering pump. So it doesn't matter if somebody changed the PLC program, they're not going to affect the chemicals and their valves are all manual. So they're not going to like isolate anything. So like their, their biggest problem is ransomware and they have backups. All right. So you don't need to worry about all this stuff. You, you, you maybe, but you have to do this risk based analysis to figure out what your consequences are to right size your remote access because it like i just explained it gets pretty damn complicated and you're asking people who don't necessarily like using computers to do a lot to use this stuff so thinking through the attack paths and inherent barriers that may be there um, to prevent you know um, abuse or consequences even applying compensating controls this is where you may need some outside expertise to help you know what's possible and what you can do to prevent it but this Evaluation of risks is really important to help you design what your remote access solution should look like. So if you have it, if you have remote access now, harden it like I described earlier, but then go through this process of figuring out what the what right looks like for you, because it really does vary for lots of different organizations. Um, consider usability. I sort of talked to that. That landing server, that's really, not everybody has that, where once you get in, you land on a landing server, and then you can have specific access based on the user on what they can and can't do. I thought that was a really unique, cool solution that I wanted to put out. Um, disable split tunneling. So on the VPN side, you can set your policy such that once that VPN is stood up, they can't like do email or go to the internet. Like They are forced to go through that VPN tunnel and whatever your policies on the your side of the VPN are a require they can't do it so like I highly recommend using that because you know the, I've seen so many VPNs where you know you can still check your email and go to the internet while you're remoted into an environment honestly I, I think you should use a dedicated computer for that anyway depending on the risk but um, anyways the split split tunneling is an important thing to consider separate credentials I talked about that and user training to make sure they keep them that way use group policies to make sure that they can't bypass that. Um, I talked about VPNs and firewalls. Sometimes they're together and that makes sense in small environments, but separating that out is really good. You know, a couple of years ago, a bunch of VPN devices were, you know, compromised and people leveraged that compromise to gain access into all sorts of environments. Um, if that was the firewall and VPN combined, like there goes all of your segmentation. It's just separate that out is a, is a nice uh, thing to think about depending on your risk profile. Um, can you def can do you have the capability to detect if somebody's abusing your your remote access? So sit down and think about what detection capabilities you have, uh, and do you have a procedure to suspend that remote access that people know? Are you training your staff on what those procedures are? Are you reviewing who uh, who's authorized to get remote access into your environment on a regular basis? 
these are just some things that I've come across. I wanted to put them out there for you guys. Hopefully you found this informative. Um, this is Dragos OT cert. I would highly encourage everybody to sign up if you will fit into the category of a small, medium-sized business. It's a really cool thing. We're drawing on really good expertise from people all around Dragos to put out how to, um, like, you know, how to information on how to address cybersecurity on like a nuts and bolts, you know, hands-on keyboard level. Um, that's it. I wanted to say thank you for listening and happy to take any questions.